Welcome to Redefining Medicine, an intimate and personalized program that illustrates a different side of the practice of medicine. Our in-depth conversations will focus on the physicians and practitioners who are redefining medicine through their integrative, functional, and holistic approach to health and well-being. Our host for Redefining Medicine is Dr. Erica Schwartz. For more than 20 years, Dr. Erica has been at the forefront of advanced patient care, taking the best from conventional and integrative medicine and applying them to prevent disease. Dr. Erica is a distinguished A4M faculty member in disciplines ranging from hormone therapy, peptide therapy, and IV nutritional support. We're here in South Beach. We're at A4M BHRT Psychedelic Track, and it's absolutely fascinating. The amount of stuff that we've learned will change the way you practice medicine for the better. So, Dr. Michelle, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Pleasure. Tell me, how did you get involved? So, I'm a pain management physician, and in South Florida, we have a huge problem with opioids. So, Shocking. when I first started practicing <laughs> pain management, I uh, was really kind of frustrated with the fact that it was just about pills and procedures. And I was just doing injections and giving people medications and not really getting to the underlying root of their pain. So I started in the cannabis industry using cannabis as a substitute for opioids. And then I got involved in plant medicine. And I realized how cannabis can alter people's consciousness. And that kind of led me to look more into what's available in terms of psychedelics. And so when I was in my fellowship, I learned how to do ketamine infusions. And that was about 13 years ago. And about five years ago, I started using it more for mental health and chronic pain, but doing it more with preparation and integration and uh, intramuscular versus IV. And so I've been in this space for five years now and really trying to help people feel their feelings and not medicate and really get to the root of their trauma and, and chronic stress. And how is it coming along? Amazing, really. <laughs> I mean, magic. It, 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 I, I mean, you can't really say magic, but yeah, very transformational for a lot of patients. It's very profound. These experiences really take them out of their story and have them understand that the body and the mind are connected and we can't really just treat the body or treat the physical part of the body without really looking at the mind. And so it helps people to really get involved and, and participate in their health care as opposed to just take a medication that numbs them and you know keeps them dependent on these medications. So you're opening more offices. <clears throat> yes, we have offices in Miami Beach, Hollywood, and Boca. But the office is very different than a regular office because... Describe. <laughs> so the environment is, has to be conducive for people to really feel safe so that they can surrender into their experience. So the, the office feels more like a community center where it, we have essential oils and we have separate rooms for people and then we have a group room where we do group ketamine also. It, both That's are, interesting. Elaborate on that. Yeah, so the, so the group work is really to be done for either one, because it's cost effective, so instead of um, having individual sessions, it's a little bit more inexpensive if you do it with other people. But also I find that healing should happen in community and not really in isolation. And so people who are suffering like to see other people who are going through similar things that they're going to so that they can witness in a compassionate way the, the way that they're feeling so that they can really help to start healing themselves. And then it creates a support group for them to have later on so that they can continue on with their transformation. Do you find that their families, friends, that there got any prior kind of connectivity between them? Joining the groups, you mean? Not yeah, like these groups. Oh you, no, the groups are, the groups are, like just yeah. We people. usually we usually just find different people who are interested in doing mm -hmm. the group, and then we uh, prepare them together, like usually virtually on a Zoom call, mm -hmm. and then we bring them all together. And they're you know at first a little bit hesitant because sure. obviously they're very guarded. They don't want to be vulnerable to strangers. And then after they take the medicine, they kind of have this heart opening type of experience where their ego is not really in the front of their mind, and they're able to kind of let go of their story and then and, sh and then share with others really what comes up and then from doing that they're able to see how a lot of their suffering is very similar to other people's suffering which really helps take them out of their 
default of really trying to ruminate about their anxiety or depression or amazing. pain. Amazing. It's amazing. So you're doing less pain management. Well, actually, <laughs> all of it is pain management right. because well, pain is emotional, physical, mental, spiritual. Right. So right. even depression, anxiety, PTSD to me is still pain. And that's why I don't, yeah, versus, you know, neuropathic pain or mm -hmm. nosoplastic pain. They're all forms of pain, but it really the parts of the brain that are responsible for us feeling our pain is very similar for depression and also for physical pain. So we know a lot about the pathways going up to the brain and coming back to the body and the way that we interpret these signals. And I think a lot of people are anxious and have a lot of fear and fear can drive physical pain. So what we try to do is calm their nervous system so that they're able to be in their body and process signals that are coming from the outside world accurately. Uh, so ketamine can be done in multiple routes of administration, mm -hmm. intramuscular, IV, sublingual. It's very personalized, so we like to get to know the person. They usually have some preparation with the coach or a therapist, and then we start to administer the medicine. And usually it's done over a few sessions, usually twice a week for three weeks in the beginning, and then it does require some maintenance. It's a little different than other psychedelics in the sense that it's a dissociative, so it gives you this break from your normal thoughts, almost like a timeout, where you're really just able to be in the present moment and observe what's happening, as opposed to the other psychedelics are a little bit more of a hallucination, let's say. So ketamine is different in the sense that, first of all, it's legal, but it's a dissociative, so it really has this property where you're actually witnessing what's happening, or almost like... It's a, it's a very interesting way of, of um, describing it because it, cre it creates this time out where you're able to process things differently. And what happens to the patients so, over time? So, well, well, so during the ketamine session, we have their eyes closed. We have mm -hmm. eye shades on, so there's no external stimulation. Mm -hmm. They listen to a very curated playlist that we um, have many different options for them based on what kind of music they like. And they're able to just kind of drift off. A lot of times people feel like their pain just floats away or their conscious mind isn't directing their experience. And so they're able to have an open mind and see a different perspective. And usually over time, they're able to decrease their medications, increase their function and quality of life and start to re-engage in certain activities that they're, they're not participating in. So what we like to do is have them participate in their health care, not just use it as a medicine, but also a psychedelic. So there's insight gained from these journeys. So they're able to come back, and then we process that with the therapist or coach. It's interesting, and you're saying it's a psychedelic journey, really. Um, but what you're talking about, if I understand correctly, is you really having them get in touch with themselves. Yeah, it, it, they, they really go inward first and then go out <laughs> outside. Right, right. So really what we're trying to do is get them to understand what's going on inside their body so that they're able to use their breath and mindfulness to really direct them inward because we're trying to connect them with their true authentic self. And a lot of people just don't know who that is anymore. So, you know, the essence of someone is really that person's power. If they're not really connected to who they are, then they're not in their power. And then they're acting, you know, in ways that are not really appropriate or aligned for what's best for them. So it's a, it's a process about connection and really setting goals so that we can move them forward on the other side of what they're fearing. And, and usually it's really connecting them to peace or, or love. The only thing that matters. Right. Um, so how does that integrate, do you think, in the bigger scope of medicine? So I think that a lot of what we're doing right now is looking at the biomedical aspect of medicine as opposed to the psychosocial aspect of it. And so most of what I do is really try to teach people how to optimize their lifestyle first. So we give them tools and we make sure they're sleeping well and moving their body well and eating healthy and then connecting to others first. But a lot of people need a catalyst to really get them to start to do that. And so I think a lot of what we're doing is optimizing wellness, but we're not paying attention to mental health. And so if you're just doing these things, but really not connected to who you are, or you're living in the past, or you're fearful of the future, then you're really not able to be in the present moment. So we're trying to get people to 
be present with their discomfort. So you have a sensation, well, you know, it's really aligning you with where's that coming from, what was the trigger, and do you need to medicate yourself, or can you just go for a walk, or can you just take a deep breath? So we're trying to teach people tools, not just give them the ketamine, so eventually they don't need the medicine, and they can just really do it on their own. How successful are you? Well, <laughs> so a lot of it has to do with how willing the patient is to participate. And so we really like to engage them from the beginning. We have a very collaborative team. So we have multiple eyes on the patients always. It's not just myself, but a therapist and a nurse and sometimes a facilitator in the room. And I would say we are pretty successful because we do have patients who continue to come back. And a lot of times ketamine does require maintenance. And then we also have patients that we don't see for months or years because they're really coping well and, and moving on with their life. So ketamine is really the only legal medicine that we can use right now. I think the other ones may have a longer half-life, so they're able to work for a longer period of time without needing as many medi medication sessions. But I think the goal is really to help people do this without the medication. It's just that sometimes they need this to start the process so they become more aware of who they are and who they want to be. You know, when you're thinking of the medical world, the rest of us, those who actually went to medical school, medical regular training, um, the medical field, conventional medical health care, looks askance to what we're talking about, right? And is that something valid, or do you think maybe it's time to open your mind and start looking at things that you're not being trained in medical school about? Right. Well, I think there was a big article that came out reviewing the fact that depression is not from a deficiency in serotonin. Mm -hmm. And when that came out, we really started to realize, well, then if all these people are on antidepressants and they're depressed and we thought it was a serotonin deficiency, what's the real cause of depression? Right. And we found that it was really from unprocessed trauma mm -hmm. that's causing neuronal atrophy in prefrontal cortex, not allowing the synaptic plasticity to happen, which doesn't allow people to process their emotions properly or focus their attention accurately. And so similar with pain we're able to realize that pain is not just in the physical body. So when we have all these problems, we need new solutions, it allows us to really open our mind to what else. And so because for 50 years, we haven't been able to do this research on psychedelics, now MAPS and a lot of or other organizations are raising billions of dollars for us to start to do this work. And we're realizing that's why it's a whole paradigm shift, because instead of just taking a medication every single day that Big Pharma wants us to do, now we can really get to the root cause of someone's pain and then help them process that and have a plan to move forward. So I think sometimes we need these problems in order to look outside the box to find other solutions. And that's why I think other doctors are pretty much open-minded to it because they realize that they have all these patients and they don't have they any don't other solutions. Right. So I think the whole pain management field is really going to change because of what we're seeing with the opioids and also because of the overlap with depression, PTSD, and chronic pain. Well, I'm actually very happy to hear that because the pain management field has always been kind of a sore spot for people like me, who is an internist by training and is doing prevention and wellness and optimizing life. And pain management was always just like, here is the pill, here is the pill. And I think doing the, you know, the uh, ketamine and doing um, the mushrooms and doing any of those was really ways to eliminate or decrease the need for the pain management, right? Right. Well, I, I think that pain management got a really bad reputation because a lot of times people were just complaining of pain, which is very subjective, sure. as opposed to actually getting a true diagnosis. And now we're able to realize that a lot of people's pain is really from emotional pain, meaning chronic stress or their response to stress or unprocessed trauma. Right, and then when we started measuring pain with the opioids on the scale and creating, you know, the pain scale, right. that created even more problems. A hundred percent. First of all, when they made pain a vital sign, now we have horrible. to ask everybody, what's your pain one through ten? Which means and you're how putting. could you? Right. And then you have to have a number. So then, right. and it's very subjective. So then right. you're giving someone a number. You're talking about what your pain is because you're being asked it. Also in the hospitals, you're always asked one through ten, and then you have 
you know, something for mild, something for moderate, something for severe, and you're getting people predisposed to using these opioids too quickly, as opposed to just, it's normal. You can have a little you're discomfort. Yeah. It's, okay. It's, okay. it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. But also pain can change the same way our uh, neuroplasticity works. The fact that right. our brain can change, we can learn new things, and we can shift our focus away from just I have pain or I'm focused on my suffering to let me have more function or quality of life by being a little bit more flexible in how we think about pain. Right. Well, we need you to publish a lot of this data, <laughs> please, and continue your work. Thank it's you. It's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.